Hello, my name is Filippo Fazzi and I'm an associate professor at the Institute of Sound and Vibration Research at the University of Southampton. I'm also a director of research of the Institute. First of all, thank you very much for having invited me to this workshop. During this presentation, I would like to talk to you about the most recent updates, a selection of the most recent updates of our research at the ISVR, and then I will focus a little bit more on the research carried out by my team, the uh, Virtual Acoustic, Acoustics and Audio Engineering team. Let's start. As you probably know, the research at the ISVR covers a fairly wide spectrum, ranging from acoustics, vibration, but also the perception of sound and vibration by humans. And you might be interested to know that recently we, um, we've undergone uh, an internal restructuration. So we kind of regrouped all our research and academics into three groups. And we have the uh, acoustics group that um, was already there. And that includes all our work on uh, air acoustics and aircraft noise, as well as work on ultrasonics and underwater acoustics. Another group is the dynamics group. and um, that covers a lot of work on uh, structural vibration, uh, a lot of trans uh, transportation vibration, especially for, for train noise and, and so on, but also all the work that we carry out in terms of human response to, to vibration, especially, is now under the umbrella of the uh, dynamics group. We then create a new group, the signal processing uh, audio and hearing group, SPA, to which I belong, and that group now uh, covers, as the name says, our work on active control, sound vibration, signal processing, of course, but also uh, all the work on uh, hearing and audiology, because there, there are some strong relation, and of course, also the work in, in audio. So I moved from uh, the uh, acoustics group to the new SPA group. And yeah, that creates a very interesting and vibrating atmosphere at the ISVR. So as I said, I will cover uh, a very small selection, I'm afraid, of some of the research activities that we are carrying out in, in the three different groups. And then I will focus a bit egoistically on my, on my own research in the second half of this talk. So we'll start by talking about the work carried out by my colleagues in the acoustic group. As you probably already know, the work covers uh, pretty much all aspects of uh, aircraft noise, noise and air aircraft engine noise. One of our long-term strategic collaboration partners is Rolls-Royce, and we are very proud to have at the ISVR the Rolls-Royce University Technology Center that serves as a framework under which a variety of projects related to uh, aircraft engine noise are carried out. I'd like to mention to you some of the most recent grants that we've been awarded. A very important one is Fantasia is Future Aircraft Noise Technology and Systems Integration Analytics. And uh, this is a multi-million project co supported by Rolls-Royce and also by the UK government. And uh, it covers a fairly wide, broad spectrum of um, subjects related to noise and aircraft, including combustion noise, duct acoustics, jet noise, and also environmental prediction of noise. Uh, another uh, project, recently awarded is the napkin project that is part of the future flight challenge. This is a very large multi-million uh, challenge set, set up by the uh, UK government and is, as the name says, about the, the future of flight and uh, is not only about acoustics, of course, but all the aspects of the flights of the future, which can include urban taxis, electric passenger planes, drones, and, uh, and so on. So a big uh, national, international challenge, if you like. Now, the napkin pro pro project specifically in its initial part, there's going to be probably multiple phases, is going to be about, it's going to be about the development uh, of uh, regional electric aircrafts. Another project is the Seneca project, is an H2020 project, so supported by European Union, and this is about the LTO noise and emissions of supersonic aircraft. Still from the H2020 European scheme is the GIN project, and this is um, the, the acronym means decreased jet installation noise, and this is about the reduction of environmental impact of takeoff noise caused by um, aircraft with closely integrated propulsion and air, uh, airframe architecture. 
These are some of the examples of the most recent projects, but I would like to give you also some other examples of research that we do in um, air acoustics and aircraft engine noise. So here are a couple of example, examples of uh, some work in the field of air acoustics. On the left hand side, we have the, the work carried out by my colleague Mathieu Gelot and Jewood Kim on numerical simulation of serrated trailing edge noise. So in this very nice animation here, so it's a very advanced numerical simulation. On the left hand side, you can see the simulation for a straight trailing edge on the right hand side, the simulation for the case of serrated trailing edge. Uh, it's not my area of expertise, so I will not try and interpret the detail of this uh, animation, but certainly by the look of it, it is very impressive and uh, I know for sure it is quite advanced. On the right hand side, uh, we can see the work carried out by my colleagues Phil Joseph and Chaitanya Parachuri on porous leading edge for reduction of airfoil interaction noise. As you can see here in the pictures, there are various kind of trailing edge that were, uh, sorry, leading edge that were designed uh, in order to uh, reduce the emission and also the noise emission that also was tested experimentally. I should also mention the work carried out by my colleague Rie Sugimoto that focuses on the fan noise propagation and attenuation and especially on the design and modeling of um, liners, really intake liners that have proved to be very effective and also, uh, still in the field of liners, the work by my colleague Alan McAlpine. You can see here on the right hand side an example of a low frequency acoustic liner that was designed and uh, 3D printed and then tested. Another interesting area of research is that of propeller noise, and especially, uh, very important right now, is the study of counter rotating propellers. As I understand, the fact that two contra-rotating propellers uh, generate quite a significant amount of noise, and that noise depends on the respective distance between the two propellers. So studying what the optimal distance is, both in simulations and, of course, also from an experimental standpoint, is certainly quite important. And here is some work on ultrasounds, and more specifically on the effect that ultrasound have on humans. This work has been led by my colleague Tim Layton, who together with my colleague Ben Linson and other ISVR colleagues have carried out a campaign to understand the effect that ultrasound have on humans. We of course are exposed to, well of course we are exposed to a fair amount of ultrasound, even if we might not realize it because we don't hear it, but are these ultrasound um, dangerous to humans? And this was the question that my colleagues tried to answer. And uh, you can read all about it in a number of papers that have been published and also some new upcoming papers on acoustics today and physics today. Let's talk about um, active control now. And I would like to introduce to you some very interesting and I believe also innovative work that was carried out by my colleagues, colleagues Steve Elliott and Jordan Shear. And this is on the active control in combination with head tracking. So the issue, as you probably know, with active control, that it can be very effective uh, and has been widely used to control especially low frequency sound. But when we're talking about high frequency sound, one of the issues is that the area where you can control sound is, is very limited, is very small. So in a car, for example, one would ideally like to control uh, the sound pressure level close to the proximity of the ears of the listener. But very often listeners move their heads and active control fails to work. So hence the idea to combine active control with, with head tracking. And I would like to show that to you in, uh, the, in this recording here of an experiment that uh, Steve and Jordan and other ISVR colleagues did. So in this experiment, what you will see here in the bottom is the uh, audio signal recorded at the ears of uh, one listener that you can see here. And uh, I will only show you a part of this experiment. And you will see that uh, if active control is activated, but there is no head tracking, when the listener is in a reference position, then active control is quite effective. But when they move the head, then you will see the sound pressure level, the, the, the amplitude of the signal go, going up. In the second part of the experiment, uh, head tracking will be switched on and you will be able to appreciate that when the listener moves his head, active control will update all the algorithm in real time because of the head tracking 
so all the transfer function the plan matrix will vary in real time and active control will be quite effective so let's play so you can see now the listener is off the Swiss spot then back to the reference position active control is effective no head tracking now limited effect and back to the reference position now head tracking is switched on and as you can see even if the listener moves his head and moves out of the reference position active control is still very effective this work was carried out in collaboration with Jaguar Land Rover Besides Rolls-Royce, another strategic partner for the ISVR is BAE Systems. We have with them a long-lasting collaboration. This is led by Professor Steve Daly and also with the contribution of Jordan Chia. And this led to the creation of the Center for Research in Active Control, CRAC. Uh, and also to a prosperity partnership that started recently. So very prestigious collaboration also supported by the UK government. And initially, um, the center focused on uh, uh, maritime application, active control for maritime applications, so to re reduce especially uh, the emission, the sound emission of um, ships and other vessels by controlling mainly vibration. But later on, uh, the collaboration is extended to active areas. We see here, for example, uh, active acoustic metamaterials that are very interesting and reasonably novel field of research. And here on the right hand side, you can see this very uh, interesting and entertaining animation of my uh, colleague, uh, Charlie House. Uh, he's a PhD student of Jordan and he's setting up an experiment about acoustic cloaking. So using fundamentally the same theory of active control, but to mask the acoustic signature of this device here, a sphere. BA system, as I said, is a, st a strategic partner for us and we look forward to collaborating with them for um, the foreseeable future. And of course, I should mention the research carried out by my colleagues in the Hearing and Balance Center, HABC. This is a subgroup that is part of the largest signal processing uh, audio and hearing group. And uh, their research covers all the aspects related to hearing and audiology. Some interesting research they've carried out, as you can see here, is the uh, test for auditor, auditory fitness for duty. This is a specifically and customized audiology test fundamentally to assess the fitness for duty uh, for sp some specific jobs. For example, if someone is working in police or, or in the military, they have some specific uh, hearing requirements that may differ from a kind of uh, other, other jobs. Therefore, they need to develop a specific listening test to evaluate the, the fitness for duty. Another interesting area of research is the study of the cochlear mechanics. You can see here a very interesting um, numerical model, a final model, of the cochlea with all the organ of corti and hair cells and so on, because uh, as important as it is, its way of working is to some extent still, still a mystery, hence the importance of the research in, in this area. The HABC is directly related to one of our most successful enterprise units, that is the um, University of Southampton Auditory Implant Service. Uh, they what they do mainly is uh, the work is related to cochlear implants for uh, profoundly um, hearing impaired people profoundly deaf people and as i said uh, is really successful as an enterprise un unit is not an academic unit but they they're uh, scientists they're working close collaboration with isvr academics last but certainly not least for this initial a first part of my presentation is some research work on the perception of vibration, human perception of vibration, and specifically the work carried out by my colleague Jing Ye, who has done an interesting study on um, the vibration related to offshore service operational vessels. And when she explained that to me, I was quite quite intrigued by that. Uh, the motivation for this study is the fact that now. Uh, 
offshore wind floating platforms um, are at increasingly distance for, from, from the coast. And therefore, uh, this um, SOV, so the um, service operational vessel that were designed for fairly short travel, now uh, operate for uh, over much longer distances and they're exposed to significant uh, amounts of vibration they're deriving both from the engine of the boat but also from from uh, the waves on the sea and so on and of course all this vibration have an effect on people who work sometimes for a long time on these vessels so part of the study is to understand the effect that this vibration have on humans especially in terms of motion sickness their efficiency their ability to sleep and, and fatigue and so on. And we do that with the help of our very advanced six axis motion simulator. Those of you who have visited Southampton have probably seen it. Seen it. It's quite a, an impressive device that we use for doing all these kind of studies on uh, human perception of vibration. I would like to dedicate the second part of my talk to uh, the work, the research work that we are carrying out in our virtual acoustic and audio engineering team which is led by myself and I, Professor Philip Nelson. Uh, specifically, I'd like to talk about the work we are doing uh, with loudspeaker ar arrays. We're using loudspeaker arrays for sound field reproduction, sound field control, but not in the sense of the active control of sound to reduce noise, but more to uh, synthesize an acoustic field and reproduce a virtual acoustic image, uh, or set of virtual acoustic image, a, a virtual sound field uh, that uh, can be used for various purposes, including entertainment and, and other applications. So I'm going to start by talking about fairly large loudspeaker arrays, like the one that you see here, and then going on a smaller and smaller scale. What you see here is a spherical loudspeaker array, a fairly large structure. Uh, you can see it in our large and aquatic chamber. It was four meter tall including 40 different loudspeakers you can see here they are very nice compact um, concentric concentric driver loudspeakers as i said there are 40 of them and the idea here was to use this array as a, a an approximation of a continuous distribution of sources over a sphere to synthesize a desired sound field in the interior of a smaller sphere What is interesting is the formulation of this problem in, in the form of um, a mathematical inverse problem with an integral equation. So the idea is to assume we have a continuous distribution of sources, our loudspeaker on this red sphere, and then we want to um, control the, and synthesize if you like, a target sound field on the surface of this smaller blue sphere. And if we synthesize it on, on its surface, then uh, the vast majority of cases we, we we get the correct sound field also if, of, on, uh, in its interior so the problem is formulated as follows we have um, source strength distribution q of y which is a continuous function that defines the loudspeaker source strength on this larger sphere and then we have the reproduced sound field which is p of x which is the sound field defined on the surface of this blue sphere and the relation between these two is this uh, integral where so p of x to produce sound field is the integral so the linear superposition of all the various sources driven the q q y at a given position y on on the larger sphere and z x y is if you like is a transfer function between a given source at given position y on the red sphere here to if you like a virtual microphone position uh, at position X on the surface of the blue sphere. And the interesting thing here is that if we set our desired sound field P of X and we assume that we know this transfer function, for example, we could assume that these are simple monopoles, ideal monopoles in free field, then the unknown is, of course, the source strength distribution q of y in other words what is the signals which we need to drive this continuous distribution of loudspeakers to achieve the target sound field well this becomes an integral equation an integral equation because the unknown is within the integral and in order to do that we need to invert the problem so from p of x we need to work out what 
the required q of y is and that's a very interesting mathematical problem starting by the, from the with the fact that you know this kind of integral equation of first kind do not have a, an ex, a, a solution really from a mathematical standpoint but as i always say being an engineer i don't care too much about that we make it work one way or the other but there are a lot of interesting mathematical properties um especially if, if you use this kind of dual concentric sphere uh, approach then this integral equation is diagonalized uh, in a very in the same way as we do with a convolution we diagonalize the operator and but in this case uh, uh, all the spherical harmonics pops out and we have if you like a one-to-one -one relation between a spherical harmonic on the surface of the red sphere and a spherical harmonic on the surface of the blue sphere and in that sense then the problem becomes identical if you like to um, near field acoustical holography spherical holography for instance and in fact the very same theory applies i'm a big fan of uh, william's book on on Fourier acoustics uh, we used a lot of that theory but also that combines with a very well established uh, audio technology called ambisonics which fundamentally is is the same thing so i spent a fair amount of my uh, time doing doing that since the time of my phd and then because of course our philosophy is to to get kind of solid math but also to demonstrate that things work in practice we we ran some experiments so what you can see here are two of my colleagues in the anechoic chamber within the large sphere and this is an array a translating array of microphones that we are using really to uh, capture a reference sound field and then to compare it with the measured reproduced sound field by the array of loudspeakers. This simulation shows the results of our experiment. So you can see here um, a top view of cross section of the sphere. Now this here is a reference sound source. There was a loudspeaker that was measured. And this here is the original sound field, namely the sound field generated by this monopole source, which is actually a physical loudspeaker in this position. And what you can see here, dashed line, is the um, is, is if you like a cross section of the uh, blue sphere that we have in the previous slide. So our target, the boundary of our target reproduction region. Now, if we then switch off the original sound field and we let the same field being reproduced by the array of loudspeakers, then we can see that we have the same sound field as the target sound field within the uh, dashed sphere dashed circle and well outside of the region we have all sort of spatial aliasing artifacts and uh, it is of course very interesting from a theoretical point of view there is so much that we have learned in terms of sound field control and also exploring all it, the physical limitations that comes from that but one of the main limitations of course is the practical application of of that for you know any industrial application uh, it's great from experimental purposes and for research, but you think about especially home enter entertainment, not everybody would like to have a four meters diameter uh, sphere in, in their living room. So we thought, why don't we think about something more compact and practical? So here is another example of another loudspeaker array, which is much more compact than the previous one. This is a um, hemicylindrical array with a dual layer of loudspeaker as you see here so this is mounted on a wall you can see there's a hemi cylinder and here are the two layers of loudspeakers this was developed uh, this and of course all the signal processing um, technology um, that drives it was developed in collaboration with our colleagues at huawei huawei is another key partner of our of isvr and uh, the challenge here was really to develop an analytical formulation of the filters because, of course, we need to take into account when computing the transfer functions, if how this loudspeaker radiates, we need to take into account the scattering effect, not only of this hemicylinder, but also of this wall. Uh, indeed, we developed the theory not only for you know, hemicylindrical, but for any kind of wedge-shaped array. So in this case, we have an, an angle of 180 degrees, but it could be any, any, any angle, really. Uh, so like a corner of a room or, or something like that and uh, a big part of this work was carried out by my colleague and friend Falk Martin Hoffman uh, what is interesting that then the um, 
this is a beam forming, if you like, exercise where the loudspeaker generates beams of sound that, can, that can be steered on the space electronically and deliver potentially different sounds in different positions in space. It's a very uh, multi-zone sound delivery is very is a very uh, popular topic right now in audio reproduction. Interesting for this hemicylindrical array because of the reflection from the wall and the, the beam pattern depends on the steering direction. What is interesting is, uh, as you can see here, the uh, hemicylindrical array could also be used in a double array configuration when you have a wall, maybe a screen with two hemicylindrical array, and then you could potentially deliver independent stereo signal to two listeners by steering both arrays. So not only we have developed the, the theory for all this, but we also uh, run some experimental tests. You see here my colleague Falk Martin in the large necroic chamber again of the ISVR. We have what is a very good approximation of an infinite buffle. And this is uh, uh, rather not, not as good as an approximation of an infinite cylinder with our little loudspeaker array in here. You can see a zoomed version. And this one here is a, a microphone array that you know, with the, with the number of microphones that sample the sound field on an arc, but then this array can be translated here on, on this rail, and therefore we can sample the sound field on a slightly larger cylinder than the, or hemicylinder than, than the uh, array, and from that we can predict the sound field in the exterior of that cylinder, but also doing a holographic approach to get closer to the loudspeaker. Indeed, this is a, a new technology that we have developed that is called um, hemicylindrical holography, if you like. We developed that in collaboration also with, with uh, Williams. And here are some of the results from that experiment. So what you can see here is a presentation of the far field radiation pattern for a beam a sound being generated by the hemicylindrical array. On the X axis, you have frequency and on phi, you have angle that goes from zero to 180 degrees, where they feel like the, the, the rigid surface is at zero and 180 degrees. And this is the case of a beam steered at 60 degrees. The, um, uh, the color scale represents in dB uh, the uh, radiation pattern that is being reconstructed using this holographic approach. And you can see a number of interesting features, of course, which is a usual problem of, of arrays that uh, the, the size of the array is of course fixed, but then uh, the frequency um, and this is of course the wavelength in the audible range varies significantly, more than three orders of magnitude. And we have some inevitable frequency dependence, dependency of the beam pattern. Indeed, if we take, uh, for example, some vertical cross sections of this figure, uh, so we look at three different frequencies, we, three, we see three different behaviors. So at low frequencies here, we see that the beam is very, is very fat because it's of course very difficult to reproduce a, a very directive beam with a, an array whose diameter is much smaller than the wavelength of the frequency to be, of the wave to be reprodu reproduced. If you go higher in frequency, we get in this region here where we have pretty much what we asked for, uh, a very good and directive beam with some side lobes, but that yeah, is, is unavoidable. Ideally, we would like this beam pattern throughout the entire frequency range, but that doesn't happen. If you go now at very high, much higher frequencies, then we start having uh, spatial aliasing problems because the distance between the loudspeaker is not small enough to properly sample the surface of the array. So what you can see here is yes the main beam but also some more pronounced grating lobes especially here you can see that are deri de deriving from um, aliasing even though this, this this fact is is mitigated by the fact they, that the loudspeaker themselves are quite directional so is less of an issue than from from theoretical simulations perhaps but also something that is really important from uh, an audio reproduction point of view is the quality of the audio especially if we are talking about some someone sitting here on at 60 degrees for a listener. So if you take now a horizontal cross section of this plot, what we can observe here is the on axis 
or on beam if you like uh, frequency response of the system and uh, quite a fair amount of our research has gone into trying to optimize all the signal processing parameters like regularization of, of the problem, uh, um, the regularization parameter and other factors in order to achieve uh, a, good, a, a good compromise, if you like, between the audio quality of the audio to be reproduced, but also with the directivity of the array. Typically, you, you can have either one or the other, but we can also play a little bit with psychoacoustics. Uh, in order to strike the, uh, uh, an optimal trade-off, and you can read more uh, on that topic in our in our papers, of course. Much of our current work is uh, focused on binaural audio, and more specifically on crosstalk cancellation system, which are really a system that al uh, allow the delivery of binaural audio using uh, loudspeakers. And we have a very long tradition in in this field. Phil Nelson has been working on it for for more than twenty years, and we are. You know, continuing the, the, this tradition at the ISVR. Uh, let me explain what, what that is. So we can say that binaural audio is fundamentally recording a given sound field by virtually or really putting microphones at the two ears of a listener. So ideally, if we capture those two binaural signals as they were, including all the scattering effect of the human head, and then we reproduce those signal at the reproducer end using headphones, in principle, because of the perfect separation between the right channel and the left channel, we can ideally deliver exactly the same signal that was recorded to the ears of the listener and therefore creating a ideally perfect acoustical illusion. Uh, it's not as simple as it sounds because of course there are a number of issues, including you know the fact that they, they, they had and the so-called head-related transfer function is not the same for all individuals. But anyway, the problem we are focusing on, being focusing on, is the fact that we want to reproduce binaural audio using loudspeakers. And one could naively think that we can take the right ear signal and fit it to the right loudspeaker, and the same for the left, left ear signal. But of course, we have this phenomenon called crosstalk, namely the signal meant for the right ear reaches the right ear, but also part of the signal meant for the left ear leaks into the right here, creating this phenomenon called crosstalk. And crosstalk uh, systems were developed in the course of the last, well, more than 20 years, in fact, that enables to compensate, at least to some extent, at least ideally, this crosstalk cancellation for this crosstalk cancellation phenomenon. But what we've done more recently is to use now loudspeaker arrays to achieve a more effective and more robust crosstalk cancellation. And of course, we can do that because of the beamforming cap capabilities that we can achieve with a loudspeaker array. Let me give you an example with a simulation. In this simulation, you can see here on the top a loudspeaker array, and here is a very simple and acoustically transparent model of a human head with a left and right ear. So what we want to do is to focus, create an ideal click here at the left ear, and ideally no sound at the right ear. If you can do that, we are indeed capable of deli delivering independent signal to the two ears because of simple linear superposition. So as you can see in the simulation, the loudspeaker will, with proper filters, will focus the sound of the left ear. And of course, in order to do that, uh, the signal the driving loudspeakers must be carefully designed. And we do that by uh, creating uh, proper crosstalk cancellation filters for this loudspeaker's array, not only in linear, linear shape, but in all sort of um, shapes and flavors. But now there is obviously a, a, an obvious limitation, uh, and that is the fact that if the listener moves, then of course the uh, focus of the beam is no longer the ear of the listener, and the all acoustic illusion that it can can be achieved quite effectively if the loud if the listener is in the so-called sweet spot quickly disappears as soon as the listener moves out of the sweet spot but you might remember the work done by Stephen Jordan on active control using head tracking where pretty much at the same time we developed uh, the application of head tracking also in the field of uh, audio reproduction and for cross to cancellation once I'm again showing the animation here, which I think is quite insightful. So 
we're talking now about cross the cancellation system with listener tracking and the idea is indeed to track the, the head and more specifically the, the position of the ears of the listener so that the loudspeaker array can and, and the cross to cancellation filters can be steered in real time so what we see here is um, a prototype of a loudspeaker array in this case with seven loudspeakers but also here you can see uh, a very small camera and the camera can nowadays quite efficiently track the position not only of one uh, listener but of multiple listeners and uh, deliver very accurately the desired sound field at the ears of the listener uh, re almost regardless of, of their position. And this technology, uh, I can't avoid uh, but mentioning, uh, has been developed by my uh, research team and then is, is currently being commercialized by our startup company, AudioCynic. This innovation can provide a better understanding of how cross talk cancellation with listener tracking works. Uh, so what you can see here is a loudspeaker array here on the top and these two red stars represent the two ears of a listener. The colored pattern here represents, in the case of the blue pattern, is the sound beam that is meant to deliver a given signal to the left ear of the listener, but as you can see it has a null in the direction of the right ear of the listener, whereas the red pattern repre represents the uh, sound beam that is supposed to deliver a signal to the right ear, but very little energy to the left ear. This is of course for one specific frequency. Sadly, those patterns will change quite dramatically depending on the, on the frequency we are looking at. And you can of course see a number of side lobes, which are more or less um, relevant and, and uh, harmful, if you like, depending whether the room is reverberant or, or not. But certainly use of loudspeaker array helps in that sense. So during this animation, we can see that the listener moves and because the listener is tracked by the camera, we can see how the two beams follow the two ears, delivering therefore a consistent binaural signal to the ears of the listener and therefore a, co a consistent and coherent uh, illusion of a virtual sound scene. Once again, this animation. I would like to thank you very, very much indeed for again your invitation and for your attention. I hope you found this talk uh, interesting. This is just a reminder uh, of where, where we are, of course, in the UK. Southampton is in the sunny south coast. Uh, I hope you will be able to, to visit us perhaps in, in, in better time when COVID is going to be uh, a memory. And feel free, by all means, to contact me. This is my email address, and I'm leaving here for your attention also the uh, links to the virtual acoustic and audio engineering webpage and also the, the link to the ISVR webpage. Again, thank you very much and goodbye.